Washington Police Department calling all cars, attention all cars. Watch for all automobiles bearing Florida license plates. Had just received tip that the Dillinger gang had arrived in Tucson. Take no chances, boys. They are armed and dangerous. That's all. <laughs> Exacting and often hazardous duties of your police and firemen demand that the automotive equipment they use deliver sparkling, dependable performance. When life or death may be a matter of a split second, their gasoline must be good. Instant starting, unlimited power, quick getaway night and day. That's why we are so proud to say that more police cars, ambulances, Fire engines and motorcycles in Southern California and Arizona are powered with Rio Grande cracks than all other brands combined. Remember, this gasoline is exactly the same as that which you can buy at any Rio Grande service station. Nothing is added. If you are now a user of Rio Grande cracks with Tetra Ethel, then you know what cracked performance means. If you are not, then try a tank full tomorrow and enjoy the smooth, effortless, 100% performance required by police and fire departments. Rio Grande Crack with Tetra Ethel costs you no more. police department are second to none in the world in handling a revolver. They are trained to shoot with the maximum amount of accuracy because we want the world to know that Los Angeles is a hot spot for desperate criminals. Tonight we bring you the story of John Dillinger, America's number one criminal who roams at large in the Middle West. It is just such desperados as Dillinger that we are prepared to meet. I have selected this story because it illustrates a timely warning to the citizens of this country that they must have trained law enforcement officers, honest and fearless, and that they, the citizens, must support their police. I asked Chief Wallard of Tucson, Arizona, to come here as my guest because his work in capturing John Dillinger and his gang is an outstanding example of police diligence and alertness. Chief Wallard, will you address the radio listeners? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I feel highly honored that Chief Davis has selected as one of his cases to be dramatized on this splendid program the activities of the men of the Tucson Police Force in capturing the notorious Dillinger gang. And I also feel it an honor that Chief Davis has asked me to appear on this program with him. However, I am acting only as a representative of those fine boys who work with me. Although I had my part in directing their activities, too much praise cannot be given to the intelligence and bravery of those police officers who did their duty unthinkingly when asked to track down the ruthless and lawless band of men we had to deal with. It is peace officers like these boys of mine and like these officers of Chief Davis that make Los Angeles and Tucson such pleasant places for you citizens to live in. I won't take any further time to tell you about the capture of the Dillinger mob. You're about to hear the story just as it occurred. As I know that you're eager for the play to begin, I'll turn the microphone over to Frederick Lindley, who will carry on with the story. Thank you, Chief Wallace. <laughs> Under a hail of 
with new gun bullets, Charles Mickley, Harry Pierpont, and Russell Clark, accompanied by seven other convicts, successfully escaped from the Indiana State Penitentiary. As the ten desperate criminals disappear into the mist of early morning, all Indiana awakens to a reign of terror. Two days later in Lima, Ohio. Are you the sheriff? Yeah. You're holding John Dillinger here? Yeah. Well, we come to get him. Who are you? Officer from Michigan City, Indiana. He's wanted there. Well, uh, you'll have to show me your credentials. Here's our credentials. Oh. Terror spreads throughout the Middle West. Hysterical fear mounts. Not since the days when Jesse James rode the prairie have respectable citizens lived in such mortal dread of a ruthless outlaw. Dillinger is loose. Indianapolis, $21,000 taken from the Massachusetts Avenue Bank. New Carlisle, Ohio. Sanders takes $53,000 from the New Carlisle Bank in daring daylight robbery. Harold, Pennsylvania. Hold up at a Harold Bank. Lost $24,000. Daleville, Indiana. Hold up at a loss of $3,500. Montpelier, Indiana. $12,000 haul from the Montpelier Bank. Racine, Wisconsin. Hold up at American Bank and Trust Company. Lost $27,000. Greencastle, Indiana. $74,000. Bank East Chicago. Hold up in the First National Bank. $20,000 stolen. One policeman murdered. Such is the list of crimes attributed to the Dillinger mob. Federal authorities combine forces with state and local peace officers. Roads are blocked. The militia is called out. Then, as suddenly as it began, the reign of terror ends. Peace once more is restored in the Middle West. The shattered nerves of farmer, merchant, and banker gradually return to normal. Dillinger seems to have disappeared from the face of the earth. A pale desert moon casts its transparent coverlet over the jagged crest of Mount Lemon. From a sandy wash, a coyote howls at the silent Sahara that broods above him. Thrusting its spiny arms toward the star-speckled velvet dome overhead. Across this scene of beautiful desolation comes a discordant note. A timid, popular song played by a three-piece orchestra in a desert roadhouse. The place is a few miles from Tucson, Arizona. It is the night of January 24, 1934. Yeah. Yeah. Surprised me, you know, to find a night spot like this out in the middle of the desert. Yeah, it's all right. But I'll sure be glad to get into that sales meeting in L.A. You know, I get the jitters out in this country. Why you liable to wake up any morning with a with a rattlesnake in bed with you? Oh, no, that's a lot of bunk. Why all the rattlesnakes are asleep in the weather? Winter? <laughs> How would a rattlesnake know this was winter? <laughs> <laughs> While well, it's three stiff collars today while I was making my call. If this is winter, then L.A. is in the Arctic Circle. Well, you don't need to worry about the snakes, Harry. Just have another shot of this. Not a bad idea. It's not a bad idea at all. Well, it's a bigger and better sale. Yeah, at least better than last year. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, pardon me, boys. Can I buy you a little drink? Why, sure. That's fine. What do you have? Well, g- give me another highball, eh? What about the tender? Oh, no, make my mistake. Hey, bartender. Yeah. Two highballs and one straight. Yes, sir. Pardon me for butting in like this, but I'm a stranger in town here, and I'm all alone. I sort of wanted company. Get it? Why, sure, that's all right. I'm glad to have you. Thanks. You look like a couple of all right mugs to me. Geez, what a crummy joint this is. <laughs> look at that thing they call an orchestra. Why, the spots back in Shy, you can... You ever been in Shy? If I ever been to Shy, I'll say. Why, I've got one of the most... Well, that's a great town, Shy. Well, they really do things. 
power mine's got a cooking racket back there, and he's making a million. That's the sort of racket to be in. Something honest, where you scare the dough out of the suckers. I don't like bump offs very much. Beef's bad wherever it's full. So when you listen to that, he's trying to sell us he's a tough guy. <laughs> he's probably handling a line of kid shoes out of Billy Apple. Yeah. <laughs> What's the rest of the that I want? Well, what was that you were saying? My part of me was just to agree that you're right. We don't care much for the bump off job as ourselves. Yeah? What's your racket? Uh, uh, my, uh, soup. Yeah? Sure. I'm a banker myself. Is that right? Sure. I don't like to work with soup. Takes too much time to get into the safe. Set the fuse. I just walk in and stick them up. It's quicker and cleaner unless you have to turn the heat on somebody. Yeah, that's right. But, you know, you get more our way. Well, maybe. Let's have another drink. Yeah. All right. By the time the desert moon has set, the two salesmen and their new friend have exchanged many confidences. On the way into Tucson, Clark, the man who prefers sticking up banks to blowing them up, discovers that they are all staying at the Congress Hotel. He invites the salesman to his room for a nightcap. Sure, things got a little hot back here, so I came out here with a couple of pals until it cools off. Uh, figuring on any stick ups out of here? No, are you? Maybe. You damn foolish guys. Yeah, why? There are only two roads out of Arizona, and every Indian woodpecker knows the country better than you do. We can never make a getaway. Uh, maybe you're right. Say, I, I got some new equipment here. Like to see it? Of course, man. Just a minute till I open up this grip. Say, will you look at that? Yeah, that's a real thing, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Here's a new super caliber machine gun. Takes a 35.1. Gee, uh, that's, that's quite a weapon, isn't it? A weapon? <laughs> okay, it is. This baby's dynamite. Rip a hole in you big enough to drive a truck. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, uh, I think we better be getting to bed. It's pretty late. Well, it's a hurry. Charlie will be here soon. Uh, who's, who's Charlie? He's my partner. You ought to see him handle a sort of shotgun. Yeah, no thanks. I, I think we better get to bed. Uh, glad to meet you, pal. Yeah, sure. No, sure. Yeah, sure. Well, I'll, I'll be an honest... Bless you, Mr. Harry. That guy's a real thing. Yeah. He ain't kidding. You're telling me? <laughs> you better report him to the police. Well, let's not be in too big a hurry. After all, he hasn't done anything to us. Yeah, but maybe he's some kind of a big gangster. The police are on the Yeah, call. maybe, but let's not be too hasty. We can talk about it tomorrow. All right, then. Okay. <laughs> Early the following morning, while the guests in the hotel are still asleep, fire is discovered in the dining room, looking upward from the heating plant in the basement. The telephone operator on duty calls the fire department, and then with heavy smoke swirling around her switchboard, she sticks to her post. No! No! This is the operator downstairs! The hotel's on fire! Get out at once! Hello? That smoke is smell. Hotels on fire. Hello? 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 Not all of them. The fire just, just got out. I can't get anyone now. Get outside, Mary. I'll try to go to the building alone. against the hastily rigged guard rope. Inside the line, Ken Makeley, his partner, watched the building burn. 
up there in the room. we got to get out. they got valuable uh, papers in them. Well, I can't get them for you now. i got other things. Wait a minute. That ladder over there is up against the window of my room. All you got to do is go up there, get the stuff, and come down. There's ten bucks in it for you. Well, okay. I'll see what I can do. Right. The fireman retrieved Clark and Nick Lee's arsenal. And in the confusion of reclaiming possessions after the fire has been put out, the two bandits get some of the clothing of the salesman. Clark and Makeley rent a house on 2nd Avenue, and the salesman trace Clark there. After they have regained their property, Clark questions them. Say, boys, it in my mind we had quite a little talk the other night before the fire. Why, why, yes. We had some drinks and talked a while. And what did I say? Oh, well, nothing much. We, we just talked. Well, listen, boys. Get this straight. I don't remember what I said. But whatever it is, it'll be healthier for you to forget it. Get me? Why? Why, sure. But there was nothing to ah, don't tell me up on me. Just get this straight, see? I'm a winter visitor out here for a vacation and nothing more. Get it? <laughs> by the threat behind Clark's statement, the salesman reports the incident to patrolman Harry Leslie, who relays the information to the chief. Chief Wallard calls traffic captain Jay Smith and detective Dallas Ford into his office and explains the tip to them. From the description Leslie got, and I think these men are members of that Dillinger mob. The description tallies with the circulars he's out here from Indiana. Now here's the address. 927 North 2nd Avenue. I want you to stake out the joint. Don't go into the house. These men are heavily armed. Wait until they come out and pick them up away from the house. And if you have to shoot, shoot to kill. The officers stake out the 2nd Avenue house. And after a little wait, Makeley leaves the house and drives downtown in a car bearing a Florida license. He is arrested with a companion who gives her name as Bernice Thompson as they are purchasing a radio. Indignant, Makeley is brought before the chief. Look here, chief. This is an outrage. Here's my card. I'm J.C. Davies. I'm in business down in Florida. I came over here to your city to spend the winter. My first week in town, I've been picked up by your men. I demand that you release me at once. Well, I'm very sorry, Mr. Davies. Possibly it's a case of mistaken identity. Well, indeed it is. Why, I I have all sorts of identification. Well, naturally, Mr. Davies, you won't object to having your fingerprints taken so that we can clear up this unfortunate matter. That isn't necessary, Chief. If you'll just send one of your men over to my house, why, why I'll clear, I'll make my identity known in no time. Yes, but uh, Mr. Davies... If you plan to spend the winter with us here, and you resemble so closely the man we're looking for, your fingerprints would give you a clean bill of health, so to speak, and you wouldn't be annoyed anymore. It isn't necessary, Chief. I can identify myself. Well, now, Makeley, you won't have to try, because we're fingerprinting you right now. J.C. Davies' fingerprints establish him beyond a shadow of a doubt as the wanted Makeley. Realizing now that he's on the trail of the Dillinger mob, Chief Wallace sends officers Ford, Foreman, and Iman to watch for the other men in the second street house. They wait for several hours, parked near the house, and no one appears. Say, I'm getting tired of this waiting around. I got a hunter in there, and I'm going to find out for sure. Better go slow, Chief. These guys are no gas station bandits. They mean business. Well, I got a plan I think will work. Look, I'm going to ask for A. Long. That's the name this other guy goes by. I'll tell him I'm a special delivery messenger. Now, you guys keep your eyes on me, and if I get in, you follow right after me. You're taking a big chance, Chris. Yeah, I know it, Frank. 
But I don't hanker to sit out here all day doing nothing. Well, okay. We'll be right behind you. All right. Here goes. What is it? Does Mr. A. Long live here? Yes. I've got a special delivery letter for him. Oh, well, give it to me. I'll do no, it. No, I have to deliver it to him in person. Well, you can't. Don't close that door on me. Say, get your foot out of that door. Open up. Come on, boys. Who wants to suppose? Keep the other guys out. I'll take care of him. Who wants to suppose? Keep the other guys out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I've got it by the hammer. He can't use it. Remember that door, Aaron. Oh, come on. Open the door. <laughs> Didn't know you were making such a big guy, did you, Copper? I'll finish you off as soon as I get over to that bed where I left the gas. Hold it, sir. I'm coming. Oh, man. Thanks, Alex. I guess that pistol weapon will keep him quiet for a while. I'm afraid not, lady. He's just sleeping for a while. But you nearly took my finger off when you slammed that door, honey. Well, I wish I'd taken your head off. No, that's no way to talk, sister, because it won't do a bit of good. You're coming along to the station house with us just the same. Clark, still unconscious, is taken to the police station where his shoes is up there. And he is identified by Mark Robbins, identification expert of the Tucson Police Department. Shortly after Clark is taken to his cell, motorcycle patrolman Earl Nolan brings the chief a piece of information. What is it, Nolan? Hey, the car these guys drove had a Florida license plate, didn't it? That's right. It was a 1934 model. Well, listen, Chief, the other night I was talking to a guy who was driving a brand new sedan that had a Florida plate. Where was it? At a tourist camp on 6th Avenue. Well, get right out there, right away, and see if you can find it. All right. <laughs> Accompanied by officers Jay Smith, Frank Hyman, and Kenneth Mullaney, no one races to the tourist camp just as the car bearing the Florida plate, loaded with luggage, is leaving the place. The police car pulls up alongside of it. All right, pull over, buddy. What's the trouble? Oh, no trouble. I'm sorry to have to bother you, but I'll have to ask you to come to the police station with me. What for? I haven't done anything. No, I know you haven't, but, well, it's the chief's orders that all out-of-state licenses have to be checked. Oh, I see. She's pretty cranky about it, so you better come along with me. Well, can't you check the place here? No, oh, I'm sorry. The chief's orders to bring in all out-of-state cars. It's only a formality. It won't take you ten minutes. Very well, then. Want to hop in the back and ride with me? No, all right, sure. <coughs> Unsuspecting, here Pont, the third of the gang, allows himself to be led into Chief Waller's office. Just inside the door, he sees Clark and Mapley's luggage. Look out, Chief, he's got a gun. Here Pont? Yeah, he's got a gun all right, Frank. But I got a hammer lock on him, and it's pointing into his own wrist. I'll fish him for the rest of the artillery. Yes, sir. Here's the other one, sir. Is that all? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, give me that gun. No! Oh. Don't have to break my wrist. Hey, look here. You got the wrong guy. Yeah, we've heard that already today. And I don't think there's much doubt about who you are, Sir Oh, say, uh, there's your glasses on the floor. Oh, you can have them. What the hell good are they to me now? Once more, Chief Wallace faces the stake out on the 2nd Avenue house. This time, he sends officers Milo Walker, Mullaney, and Gene Heron. They have orders to arrest anyone who enters the place. Mullaney hides at one side of the house with a sawed off shotgun. Walker, armed with a submachine gun, is behind two subs at the other side. Heron waits in a parked car some distance away. In the early evening, just as the dusk is deepening into night, a car pulls up across the street from the house. As the officer of the car gets out, Heron follows him across the street. 
The detective was five steps behind Dillinger when the bandit stopped in his tracks. But the sight of blood which had fallen on the porch steps and cross was taken out. Aaron stepped up to him as Dillinger wheels around, hands in his coat pockets. Put your hands up, Dillinger. What is it? A stick up? No, it's an arrest. Now put him up. Oh, I'm squeezing the trigger. An arrest? What for? What's the time? Pity this injustice will be for the time being. Walker, Mulaney, how about that girl in the car over there? No, you don't, Dillinger. You feel that in your ribs? Now, if you get a chance, I'll let you have it. Now, if you don't mind, I'll relieve you of your gun. Huh. Two of them, huh? One on each side. And now, if you lower your hand... All right, all right. Come on, now. Cut out the politeness. Put the bracelets on and let's get down to your lousy jail. I won't be there very long anyway, but there isn't a jail in this country strong enough to hold me. Overnight, the names of the brave officers of the Tucson Police Force are household words the nation over. As the news of the capture of the Dillinger Gang is flagged to a relieved nation, securely locked in the Pima County Jail, four criminals threaten and snarl at their capture as Chief Willard and Sheriff Dalton place an extra armed guard of 20 men around the courthouse. By rail and by plane, officials rush Tucson from Wisconsin and Indiana. Each state eager to extradite the men for crimes in their territory. After days of legal complications, Dillinger is spirited away by plane to Crown Point, Indiana, to answer for the murder of the patrolman in the East Chicago holdup. A day later, the other three bandits leave by plane for the East to face trial in Lima, Ohio, for the murder of Sheriff Father. <laughs> Justice is swift. Harry Pierpont and Charles Makeley have already received mandatory death sentences for the murder of Sheriff's father, and Clark is soon to be tried. But Dillinger has made good his boast. Equipped with a wooden revolver of his own fabrication, Dillinger, a fortnight ago, bluffed his way out of the Lake County Jail in Crown Point, Indiana. Once more, the man hunted on. Once more, the roads throughout the Middle West are blockaded by questioning officers. Once more, peaceable citizens chase with terror. Once more, the cry goes up, Dillinger is loose! <laughs> once more loose, but he will not be at liberty long. Any man who elects to declare his own personal war against society has all society against him. There has never been a man since time began who could get away with that sort of attitude long. Dillinger has asked for it, and the next time he runs up against a police officer, it may not be as humane a chap as Jimmy Heron. He may not get a chance to put his hands up. The officer may shoot first and talk afterwards, which in the case of men like Dillinger is the most efficient way to operate. Ladies and gentlemen, Rio Grande cracked gasoline with tetraethyl is made by a modern, not to the minute refining method, the cracking process. That is where it gets its name. By subjecting the crude oil to terrific heat and pressure, the result is a gasoline that averages 10 points higher in natural anti knock than gasolines which are not cracked. Also, tetraethyl lead has long been one of the many advantages of Rio Grande crack. We suggest that you give Rio Grande a test. Try one thankful. We believe that once you have experienced the flashing performance of this great gasoline, you'll never again be satisfied with gasolines made by old-fashioned methods. You be the judge. To 
Tucson Police Department calling all cars, attention all cars. In reference to broadcast 17, three of the suspects referred to in this broadcast are now in custody. But Dillinger is loose. Watch your step, boys. That's all. Thank <laughs> you.